But it's like there's obviously something to this whole paradigm of muscle and inflammation as the main drivers of aging. Because if we can, if we can f- imagine you're 100 and you're still squatting like 315 or something. Yeah. I think that's really possible with what we have developed already what we have. And this is just the beginning. Wow. And so, so imagine because I'm going to like I'm going to do the false data in every one and a half, two years. Like obviously Jordan will like a lot of people will be doing it. Right. Because and wh- then you're not going to lose muscle and you're going to maintain it. So even when you're 60, you still have strength. You still have, so why how like why would you be aging? You know, what I mean, you would be aging technically a little bit, but it's going to be so much drastically slower. So is there a theoretical lifespan with this type of therapy? I think we're right now we're estimating at least 150. Uh, <laughs> oh. But I think I think you know I think with genetic engineering this could be pushed way beyond that. So is that wow. now? This is the question I always have because the lifespan thing comes up a lot. It's based off of the technology we have today, or based off of the projection of the technology into the next 30, 40 No, even years. with just what we have today. Okay. So because we have the, fo- we're the only group in the world that has a statin, right? And yeah. so that's the world's best anti-aging therapy. Like it's, it's, we have a phase one trial to push it, uh, it's being published. And uh, so that's already data out there. Yeah. Now, if you were to do it on a, on a curve and extrapolate out, just not just from where we are currently and putting statin into the world and watching its effects through you know decades, generations, but starting to plot the graph with the rate at which we're making these significant developments in regenerative medicine, what is the lifespan if we keep at this pace or we start to, you know... Dude, I it's, it's, it's like Moore's Law. It's, I mean, it's not... Maybe not quite like a semiconductor or like computer chip, but like, man, the, the rate at which this stuff is accelerating is insane. Everyone is investing into regenerative. It's becoming like a buzzword now. It's almost annoying when people say, I'm a regenerative medicine doctor. I'm like, no, yeah. you're not. Where, where do you practice? <laughs> yeah. My, <laughs> for Florida? Yeah, yeah let me tell you. Online. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. a drug dealer. <laughs> yeah. 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 So <laughs> it's, it's becoming a buzzword where everyone wants to be in regenerative medicine. Me and you were talking about it like six years ago. Like I've been into this since like literally since I started practicing. But now it's everyone's like finally sees that this is the future. So in 10 years from now, I think almost every doctor will have some sort of regenerative medicine part of their practice, which is fine. But... That also means there's a lot more minds, a lot more research, and a lot more innovation that's going on. So our plan, you know, with our company is kind of be the guys who figure out the best emerging tech and then acquire those so we can keep developing and keep being the leaders in this field. You're going to be the Google. Exactly. Wow. So because emerging tech is by far, the, I would say, the most difficult skill set in identifying what's the best. Because there's like a million things out there now. Everyone wants to do longevity and regenerative medicine. It's actually, it's so annoying. And, and like... Longevity to me is it's also a bullshit word because it basically is just like, you know, this doctor who's just going around recycling all the fitness industry stuff that we've been talking about for 20 years. Protein, <laughs> yeah. muscle. Yeah. Like, thanks. Thanks so yeah. like, Go thanks. to a step up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but that's not, re- to me, that's not real longevity. Real longevity is what we're doing, which is we can extend the health span of you being able to lift heavy, work out, li- feel good. That's what it's all about. And because everyone, like everyone, kind of already knows about the basics, but now it's like, how can we intervene so you can do the basics as long as possible? I think dualism in the medical community has set people, set the industry, set the world back a lot. Like the separation of mind and body as two separate entities and that are that are treated differently, I think, has been a disservice of common Western medicine since its inception. Now. You know, if you let me lift weights until I'm 150, how are you equating or what is, how does this work in what is currently seen as more specialized tissue, like central nervous system tissue, brain tissue? How do we stop aging? You know, yeah, uh, this guy looks great. Why is he drooling at both sides of his mouth? Because he's actually Frodo Baggins and he's 145 <laughs> years old. It's like, oh, he looks, he looks like he's 35. It's like, yeah, but his brain looks like fucking mush peas. That's, and that's why you got to come back to first principles like we talk about, right? And so what's the main mediator of aging? It's immune senescence and immune tolerance and immune dysfunction so essentially your immune system and so a dysfunctional immune system and we know now the immune system and the nervous system communicate as well and so if you keep that immune system from becoming dysfunctional which by far the best way to do that is through muscle there's a lot there's papers on that that came out recently that muscles actually help to uh, they help with something called t regulatory cells which are kind of always putting the brakes on your immune system and regulating how it works in terms of the signaling cascade. And so those T-reg cells are so important. And as you get older, they become dysfunctional. 
And so if you can, but now we know that by having muscle mass, it actually prevents them from becoming dysfunctional. So if we can keep that preservation of those T reg cells, then you're not going to get those senescence. You're not going to get that immune dysfunction that's going to cause that inflammation in the brain and cause you to drool and all that crap. Okay. So like, you know, things like dementia, you know, people are calling dementia now like type three diabetes, which I think is really shattering the, the paradigm of the duality between like mind and body, which I, I think is again, like a real disservice. So you're saying that these things won't necessarily act directly on the brain, but as direct as indirectly as things act on the brain as it currently stands. Is that kind of it? Exactly. But guess what our next product is? It's for the brain. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. So it's called Clotho. So Spell that for me. K-L-O-T-H-O. Is that an acronym for something? No. It's a peptide. Okay. And it's a peptide that's actually secreted in response to exercise. So folostatin and clotho are both peptides that get released when you do high intensity resistance training. Your levels transiently go up. And the, and the reason for that is because they have all these effects in terms of folostatin, like we already talked about, inflammation, myostatin inhibition. But clotho, it protects against neurodegeneration. And it's been shown to increase your IQ by six points on average. Wow. <laughs> so I'm definitely... Two uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're good. Yeah, Fuck yeah. you. You're brilliant. <laughs> no, <right? laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take two and see what happens. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so my vision is imagine you come into like an Eterna clinic. You get these different gene therapies. You get Clotho. You get Falstatin. And we have a few others in the works. And then you get your... If you need stem cells, then you're just, you're just delaying that whole aging process. Can you explain to me, so in having the fall set and done, in kind of following you along and, 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 you know, getting to chat with you kind of behind the Iron Curtain as this stuff has been developed, can you explain the vector process of like what you have planned with Clotho, what you're already doing for follow statin? Because that to me is, of all the stuff that I can understand, which I'm sure there's stuff that's like crazy if I understood it, but I'm too dumb to understand it. I'm dumb enough to understand the, the mechanism of delivery. When you explained it to me, it's still blowing my mind. So clotho, folostatin, and the other you know hormones and peptides that you guys have having come down this product line. How does it work? It is, yeah, it is actually very cool. And it's, it is groundbreaking actually. So Viral vectors were always kind of the transfection agent. A transfection agent is just like what you're using to encode whatever gene you want to tell your body, and that's what a gene therapy is, right? What would be some examples of viral vectors used in the past? Adeno-associated virus, AAV, or lentivirus. These are just like... But the problem, because the, the reason they were used is because they're ease of use in the lab and um, they don't have to be manipulated. But then the problem was they're expensive to manufacture and then they also can translocate. And when they translocate, that can obviously affect your genome and cause infections and just people who's died, died from it. It's rare, but it's happened. And so... So just, just to catch people up, because this is fucking insane. Yeah. <laughs> Previously, they were using viruses to carry good things around the body. It's like, well, viruses are very good at spreading quickly. L but let's change the message to something good. Viruses are maybe not the most stable way to do it. You can you translocate. They can actually just turn into the damn virus that you're using, which is like, oh, well, all the good it's carrying <laughs> yeah. completely wiped out by all the bad of the virus itself. But the vehicle being so virulent, being able to get through the body is a great vector to carry the good thing around. So that was what they used to do. Yeah. And the problem is once you have a virus, it's also not reversible. And so people were always interested in something called plasmids. So plasmid is basically a circular strand of DNA that exchanges information. It's of bacterial origin, but there's no actual live bacteria in there. So it's just a circular strand of DNA, hence the name mini circle. And so that mini circle can be used to transfect a local piece of tissue with whatever gene of interest we want, and it just stays in that tissue, and it tells your body to increase production of that gene of interest. And so, for example, with the statin gene therapy or clotho, it's such an easy, it's literally just an injection in your subcutaneous, or we're actually looking at statin in the muscle now because it seems like it might be even better, more effective. Yeah, exactly. You're gonna, we're going to do it on your muscle, yeah. <laughs> and so it's, and it's so easy to administer and it's also reversible because it's of bacterial origin. So if you take a tetracycline because it's of E. coli origin, then it's actually a kill switch. So meaning if for whatever reason you want this out of your body, you can just take an antibiotic and it's out. Wow. And it's, it's such a cool technology. And I, it's be, it, we're going to publish it in Nature Biotech. And 
I think Walter and Mac, who are the inventors of it, the two scientists, they, I mean, I think they did, they did deserve a Nobel Prize at some point for this because it's just like unbelievable tech. And because of the ability to scale it, because you can, it's, it's temperature stable, it's easy to transport, it has all these amazing kind of safety measures in there in case something goes wrong, which is like almost impossible. And you can target anything with 100% specificity. There's no offsite targets. Because you know with CRISPR, like gene editing, there's offsite targets. This is just one protein peptide, gene of interest, always 100% reproducible each time.